Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. This is your host, Hallie Teco, and today's podcast is going to be a little different. I've been interested in the intersection of climate change and healthcare for some time. So I reached out to my buddy, Jason Jacobs, from the podcast, My Climate Journey, to see if he'd want to co-host an episode that's at the junction of our two podcast themes. We found a great speaker, Dr. Dara O'Carroll, who is a Hawaii-based ER doctor turned science communicator. He's currently making a documentary series called Infected Planet to illustrate how climate change is affecting global and public health. I hope you enjoy this special episode. Okay, Dara O'Carroll, welcome to the show. Uh, th- thanks for having me. Good to be here. <laughs> well, Dara, to kick things off, maybe talk a bit about your uh, background and work. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, um, I guess I'll start with with uh, my education. I was uh, born in Ireland, uh, raised in Hawaii. That's where I'm talking to you from now. And how I got into climate and health, you know, emergency medicine is maybe one of the fields that's going to be impacted the most by by climate change because we're on the front lines of everything, as we've seen in the last two years. And 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 we've also had great examples of, of what happens when our global health is just radically all of a sudden changed with the pandemic. So it's a great time to be dis- discussing this. Um, how I originally got into it was back in, I think, 2017. I was reading a global health journal, just kind of skimming through it. And I saw an article about a, a village in the Kenyan Highlands where uh, they were high enough, their altitude was high enough that they didn't get any uh, mosquito-borne illness, specifically malaria. And you know that you know malaria is extremely prevalent all over uh, Africa. And um, all of a sudden, because of climate change, the higher humidity and the higher temperatures, mosquitoes can't replicate above uh, or below temperatures, I believe, of 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Climate change had caused this village who hadn't had a malaria outbreak in, you know, 80 years, or a recorded one at least, to have this massive malaria outbreak. And I was like, wow, that's just if this little point in the globe is experiencing this change in health, what else is happening? And unfortunately, the more layers you peel back, the more that you see. It's almost every aspect of health is being impacted. And so that was 2017. And then right after that, and probably the formulating event that really pushed me to really, really jump into climate and health communication was I was asked to be a medical uh, officer on the Polynesian Voyaging Society's uh, canoe voyage from San Diego back to Honolulu. And the Polynesian Voyaging Society is very, very uh, interesting in that back in the 60s and 70s, the uh, the historians here in, in Hawaii the predominant notion of how Hawaiians ended up here was by accident and that the travel from Fiji or uh, other parts of Polynesia wasn't done intentionally. And so uh, there was a huge movement and renaissance of, hey, look, let's, let's get back to the traditional forms of voyaging, which is using the star compass, which is not GPS, which is not any sort of magnetism whatsoever. And so since then, there's been this renaissance of, of, of uh, using the earth and the globe and the wind and the sun and the moon and the star compass to, to navigate. And so back in 2018, they were completing the worldwide circumnavigation of the globe just using all of those natural resources. And so I was on one of the last legs from San Diego back to Honolulu. And I specifically remember on, like, I think it was day seven, and, you know, you have one shift during the day and one shift in the middle of the night. And I remember uh, steering the, you know, the big canoe and it was kind of a, not that heavy of a, of a, a windy day. And how you lock in the star compass is you get a piece of rope or sailing and the navigator tells you, all right, we're heading the right direction. And you make sure that whatever that star behind what you're looking at, the rope or the sail remains roughly where it is. And so I was looking up at the star, steering the canoe, and I saw this plane heading over me. And it just uh, in, in my head, I kind of was like, okay, that plane is day seven. I started to get a little hungry. It was cold. We don't have showers. We're salty for a long time. That plane had traveled, you know, 500 miles in the last hour. And then I was kind of like dejectedly like, was like, okay, we just did what that plane did in one hour in like six days. Because <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a pretty slow canoe. 
And so it was a long and arduous uh, um, journey, um, 19 days. And when we finally got back to Oahu, the northern uh, tip of this island that I'm speaking to you from now, the, the mo'olelos or the, the stories or the, the legends, really the navigators talk about not finding the islands, but pulling the islands out of the water, pulling them out of the ocean. And that's really what it felt like. And so... The whole journey kind of, um, you know, felt to me, like, wow, it took me 19 days to travel just halfway across the largest ocean in the world. And what we saw and fished every day and caught mahi-mahi every day was, you know, living off of, off of the ocean. Yet we are impacting the world in such a grandest scale. And I had just seen only, you know, half of the largest ocean. It just like really hit home that like, all right, so this, this story needs to at least somehow get out and how can I help? And then finally, the, the, the icing on the cake was um, as an emergency physician, I also volunteer for a, uh, a couple of different disaster agencies, and one was Team Rubicon. And uh, right in the end of 2019, there was a Hurricane Dorian, which was Category 5 um, Hurricane Dorian that spun through um, the Caribbean and hit the northern Bahamian islands of Abaco and Great, Great Palmas. And it was just an absolutely devastating hurricane. For two days, it was so powerful and it, it slowed down to just one mile per hour of moving westward. Two days, there was no communication into that island or out. And even in our modern era, I can't even fathom that, but disaster agencies collectively were holding their breath for those two days. And what, we, what are we gonna see uh, on the other side of this? And that was actually three years ago to, to the day um, that we're recording this, that I, I stepped onto that island about a week after the hurricane hit. And it just utterly looked apocalyptic. It looked like an atomic bomb went off. All the pine trees were snapped in the same direction. None of the leaves left on the trees were there. All the salt from the storm surge of about 20 to 25 feet had turned everything into a muted and dead brown. And to think, and I just looking around and just driving through the ruins that Everybody with a carbon footprint played a hand in that disaster. And I was walking through it and uh, we uncovered a teenage body underneath a, a, some rubble and the search for, for life had long ended at that point. And so to see just the physical impacts of what climate can do uh, was really like, OK, so this 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 story needs to be told and, and how can I help? And so that's that's really how um, my journey started and, and continues to go uh, from this day. And what did you conclude in terms of how you could help and and maybe talk a bit about that process from there? I think a lot of people are surprised to hear is, you know, and uh, I think the notion that our world is being changed and that glaciers are, are, are melting and that polar bears aren't having any habitat, I think alone in itself should have been enough. But when you start talking about that human health is being changed in almost every aspect, uh, most people are really surprised. And so one aspect that, you know, um, Jason, you're up in the Northeast, that's the uh, health is changing is that Lyme disease um, and specifically ticks that are um, having longer summers and shorter winters, which means any arthropod that's being in warmer environment can spread a little bit farther. And so Lyme disease and other other um, parasites that are being um, transported by the black-legged tick are spreading and having increased numbers. If you look at the numbers that the CDC records, it's almost like a, you know an amoeba that's spreading out from, from Rhode Island and up into Maine, now into Canada. And so the, the health impacts, you know, when you look at it from an infectious disease standpoint, there was just a research article that came out of the University of Hawaii uh, just three weeks ago that said over 58 percent roughly of infectious diseases are being impacted positively, meaning they're increasing due to climate change. And most people, when you start talking about the health impacts, are like, whoa, OK, so let's slow down here. What else what else is happening? And the more we talk, the more the, the more that just really gets unveiled. And so what are you doing, Dara, in terms of, I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the problem and how it is bringing about unintended negative consequences for health. Do you have a theory of change or something that we can do about it? Or, or are you more focused on the understanding of the problem itself? Just bringing awareness in itself 
and letting people realize that, hey, you know, we've just gone through this global pandemic where our global health has just been completely impacted. There were lockdowns. But um, what is this sinew that's going to actually be changed throughout our, uh, you know, the rest of this decade or throughout the rest of this century? And if you just look at pandemics in themselves, right? In these last two decades of this century, we've had, you know, the original SARS, we've had MERS, we've had swine flu, bird flu, now we've had COVID and monkeypox. Back in 2013, there was a study out of University of Kinshasa and UCLA that said, hey, look, we modeled the IPCC fourth models out towards 2050, 2080. And it's looking like if we don't do anything because of the deforestation and changing climate, monkeypox has a really high risk of moving into areas it's never been before. And look what's happened, right? Monkeypox has now gone internationally. And that's just specifically looking at infectious disease. So I think just bringing awareness and communication. And there's a real kind of, there's a real dichotomy here. It's like some of these things that you start talking about become very confronting. And so how do you, how do you stop the climate doomism that is associated with the, the health effects, right? But does that mean that we need to, we have to ignore it? And so it's a very delicate balance of saying, hey, look, uh, our health is being impacted in all these different ways. Yet, do, is that um, something that we should talk about or is that something that we should ignore? And I'm on the side of we should talk about it, but also on the other side of every health disease is either prevention or a cure. And so there's always positives to talk about. Hallie, what about you? What, what's been your journey to, <laughs> to, to, I mean, what, what led you to, yeah. to email me in the first place about exploring this intersection? Yeah, well, so I have... Um, I got my MPH kind of later in my career. I finished up in 2020 and um, I, I probably took one class in environmental health. I think that was just one class that was required, but it was really eye opening. And, and the hard thing is it it really climate is touching like every aspect of human health. So it's not like we can point to just one thing. Like, like I think traditionally we've thought of natural disasters and injury as kind of the big condition that we need to protect for. But really, it's these ongoing chronic illnesses that are created, whether the increase in asthma, the increase in Lyme disease, like Dara said, um, any infectious disease around the world, even just thinking about forever chemicals and the impact that they're having on obesity, cancer, just so there, it's such a complex relationship that humans, animals, and the ecosystem have, and it's, it's delicate and we've just completely broken it. So I, my question, Dara, I want to hear from you who's hurt the most. I mean, we just have been hearing about these, the, these tragic floodings in Pakistan mm -hmm. and you hear about flooding in the South on the coast. Do you feel like there's a socioeconomic tie to this and that people who can position themselves in places that are less likely to be struck by disasters or do you think everybody's kind of hurt equally? No, absolutely. There is a socioeconomic tie. Jumping back to that experience I had in the Bahamas, the area and the people that were impacted the most were this area called the mud and the peas. And it was mostly undocumented Haitian immigrants who were in mm -hmm. the Bahamas to work and they didn't have the means to leave. And if they did leave, they were undocumented. And if they were to you know, go into a different island, they'd be shipped back to Haiti. And so their their area of of where they were staying in in North uh, Abaco was the lowest lying area, and it's really a kind of almost looked a little bit like like a shanty town. No no you know specific foundations, and mostly just tin roofs and tin huts, and everything just got completely completely decimated. When you look at photos, if you ever look up you know Hurricane Dorian and any of the coverage there, what most pops up first is the mud and the peas. And there was, I think, 1,300 people missing um, a week after. Um, and most of the deaths came from that area as well. And uh, I remember I was, you know, um, stitching up a young kid who had hit their head on, on a piece of wood just outside of that area. And, and one of the moms was telling me about how they were holding on into the attic uh, as the storm surge came up, holding on to their rafters, praying that their house just wouldn't fall apart. Thankfully, you know, they were able to, it did, but they were able to escape somehow. And so two days of 20 foot storm search to survive. And they eventually made it up to a church and the church almost got flooded as well from there. 
And then when you look at like something that's prevalent everywhere, we've all been experiencing this summer of heat illness. And so who's impacted the most by the heat illness is one, those who can't afford air condition mm -hmm. and two, those who mostly live in deep urban environments uh, that have, you know, lots of concrete, lots of asphalt that really hold on to the heat because there's this uh, effect called the urban heat island effect. And so compared to the suburbs, uh, you know, uh, inner city can be at least eight degrees Fahrenheit hotter. And then what's very predictive of, of disease caused by a heat wave is the failure of nighttime environment to cool down. And so those who are vulnerable are those who uh, live in their inner cities. And then also those who, um, who have pre-existing medical conditions that pre predispose them to the negative effects of, of heat. So people with heart issues, kidney issues, those who can't af afford healthcare or those who are unable to obtain healthcare in any, any meaningful sense. And so there's absolutely a socioeconomic tie. And when you look at the flooding that just happened in Pakistan, what, what is the carbon output of, of Pakistan compared to the rest of the globe? Like pretty minimal. And they're experiencing one of the worst effects as well. So you're, you're right, Haley. And it, it's, 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 it's hard to fathom sometimes when you really kind of look deep into it, but I think it's, it still needs to be talked about. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. And so we know the impact of climate change on health, but what about the impact of the health industry on climate and thinking about just in the U.S., hospitals, the medical sector overall, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies are responsible for over, I think it was like eight or nine percent of U.S. U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, not to mention the consistent use of single use plastics in healthcare delivery. I'm curious, I'm sure, you know, your work in intensive care in the ER, you know, you were exposed to all of this, you know, what can the healthcare industry do? Because it, it's, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And you're right. And we're using more N95 masks recently before this pandemic. Um, you know, the only time I would use an N95 is if somebody had something like tuberculosis or something that was already respiratory contagious, but those are being used more, masks are being used more, gloves are being used more. One encouraging sign is that a lot of hospital systems, not every hospital system yet, but a lot of hospital systems do have climate officers or do have chief uh, sustainability officers. So there is some awareness, there is some movement. And that's the other thing that's been happening, I've, I've been seeing over the last couple of years, is there's now awareness of beginning of the climate and health aspects. There's new textbooks. Some textbooks are now in their second edition. There's some journals that are specifically linked to the Journal of Climate and Health. Um, the Journal of Environmental Psychology as well, just to name a few. And so the awareness is happening, but I don't think the the complete solutions are move, uh, have been moving forward yet either. So I think there's still a lot of room, just like every aspect of, I think, climate. There's still a lot of room for, for improvement. One question that, that I have is the problem of climate change or heat blanket or GHGs or however you want to frame it, it's it's a pretty invisible problem and it's pretty distributed, right? It's like horizontal, if you will, across the planet. And medical issues tend to be a lot more visible and acute. How do you know what's attributable to what? I mean, we had natural disasters before <laughs> climate change. We had heat waves. We had, we, we had flooding. We had droughts. Uh, what is it that makes you so convinced that climate change is exacerbating health issues? 
Sure. Yeah. When, when you look at the natural disasters, uh, we'll start there. Every For every one degree Fahrenheit of warmer water, right? So so hurricanes, we'll start it with hurricanes, are specifically heat engines. And so one degree Fahrenheit of warmer water. And a hurricane can't form with waters less than 79 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has to have at least that qualification first. But for every one degree Fahrenheit warmer, you get a, a higher wind speeds, roughly around 15 to 20 miles per hour. So that's what happened in, in, in 2019 with Hurricane Dorian, is just the waters around the Bahamas were cooking, you know, absolutely baking. They were in the low 90s, I believe. And so that just spun that hurricane up from, you know, a, a category one to category five, I think in less than 36 hours. And so it just really, really blossomed. And then when you look at um, how much water vapor can the environment hold, well, it can hold more if it's hotter, right? It can, for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature, it can hold 7% more water. And that's why we're seeing these huge deluge of, of just dumping of water that's causing these massive floods in, you know, southern United States, also in Pakistan. The, a warmer atmosphere can hold more water. And that doesn't mean that droughts aren't going to happen either. It's changing the dispersion of, of, of where the water is, is going, but where the water falls, it's falling harder. And then when, when you look at if you just kind of imagine a bell curve when it comes to heat waves, if you just move that bell curve one or two points over, something, a heat wave that's now, you know, used to be one in 1,000 chance of happening is now one in 100 or doubling. And those are just rough numbers that I'm just pulling out of my head here just to make it simple. But things are increasing. And then um, when you look at forest fires as well, like we've all seen just, wow, like in Australia back in 2019 into 2020, their length of, of a normal forest fire season is, was usually a couple of months, but that whole side of the country, the Eastern coast of Australia was burning for six months. And when you talk to firefighters and chiefs of the fire um, um, uh, brigades there, they're like, we've never seen anything like this. And this is not just a new normal, it's like a new extreme. And so nobody's fought fires in that sort of environment before, but it's becoming like what happens now just on a, a yearly basis. And so we're charging the atmosphere, we're you know increasing every sort of extreme when it comes to extreme weather events. And the trickle down as well as our changing currents as well. So that's what's happening as well is that we're having, it's kind of rewriting medical textbooks throughout the globe. So say I practice in Hawaii, if Lyme disease showed up in Hawaii, the first month or two, I wouldn't be diagnosing it because I'm not used to diagnosing it. And so uh, it's, it's causing doctors to pause and it's causing different migratory animals to move into different areas as well. So it's, it's, pervasive. And I, I keep kind of harping on that, that like almost everything you look at is changing, but it really is. Textbooks are really kind of just having to get new chapters now. Yeah. I'm, I mean, are medical schools even cut up? Is there any course in this that's required yet for med students? There, thankfully, there there are. Specifically, I could speak to University of Hawaii. I'm giving some a lecture next week about the, some of climate and health effects. I'd love to understand and this is not meant to minimize the importance of talking about it. It's just maybe to try to better understand how the dots connect. So like when we talk about it now, even it makes me anxious, it makes me depressed. And that's the mode I found myself in prior to four years ago when I started focusing on climate solutions and focusing on solutions and how to accelerate the transition and unclog the arteries of the system and undo blockers and foster more collaboration and get more talent into the space. That's been really kind of filled me up with fulfillment, but also optimism as I see how many smart people are moving in and how much is happening. When we talk about the problem, it's illustrative, but it's depressing and it's not necessarily mobilizing, at least to me. And so I'd love to understand in your view, why is talking about it important? And I know it's like, well, it, it illustrates the problem, but it's like, then what? How does it actually make things better versus just cause exacerbate mental health issues in, around the world? Can I chime in on that quickly? I, I'm i really curious, Dara, your answer to this, but I, I just want to point out that if, in case anyone listening doesn't know, healthcare is a giant shit show. <laughs> the industry has so many issues from rising costs to worsening outcomes. Our average lifespan in the U.S. is declining. 
there are so many pressing challenges that are acute and that are prevalent today in healthcare. And I feel like this is a chronic condition that our healthcare system has that is worsening and is lethal. But I, I'm I'm curious, like as Jason said, so talking about it is one thing. And I do think it's necessary, right? We have to have these conversations in the healthcare industry as an industry that is worsening the climate crisis and as an industry that is impacted and whose jobs are going to get harder because of the climate crisis. We have to have these conversations. But where can we fit in solutions? Because this is it. like we are we already have a doctor shortage. We're already understaffed. We have a nursing crisis. Like where do we possibly fit in solutions from the healthcare perspective given the situation in healthcare as it is even without climate issues? And the last thing I'll say before I answer that is like either <laughs> either tell me what I can do or stop talking to me about it because it just makes me feel helpless and depressed. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, it, and then, but, I mean, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm being kind of intentionally controversial here, but I, I'm yeah. kind of serious, like, like, okay, great. It's illustrative. I get it. But now what, like, how does that translate or, or what does it accomplish for me to now know about it? Sure. That, I'll, I'll point to, um, there was a study actually coming out in this month's journal of environmental psychology out of the UK where they surveyed 1300, uh, UK adults and they surveyed their levels of climate anxiety. And what they showed, there was a positive correlation with climate anxiety and changes in their lifestyle to impact climate. So there's a certain level of climate anxiety that's actually fruitful. And so I think like anything, there's, you know, include everything in moderation, including moderation, as Oscar Wilde said, right? There's, there's too much and there's too little, but and you've got to hit that right point. And so it's a very good point, Jason, that like, this is, can be interpreted as like extremely, extremely depressing. But on the other side of every health challenge is always a solution, either prevention or a cure. So specifically, let's talk about probably one of the most depressing climate aspects of health that I've heard is in Bangladesh, already a low-lying and heavily impacted climate vulnerable country. The women who live closest to the rivers were experiencing higher rates of miscarriage, and not just higher, double the rates of miscarriage compared to the rest of the country. Uh, and why was that? They found that the sea level was rising, and because they were living closer to the rivers, the sea level was, and salt specifically, was seeping into their drinking water. So here there was climate change is now impacting the rates of miscarriage in these women. And so to me, that's like one of the most depressing health as impacts I've, I've come across to date, not minimizing anything else, but it's just like, wow, okay, this is really, really impacting people's health. But what are people doing about it? They're increasing, um, you know, walt, uh, water sanitation. They're increasing uh, desalinity in and creating awareness in these villages because when you don't have awareness of what the health impacts are, you're, they're just going to continue to impact you. And so it really reminds me of what happened back in the early 2020 with this pandemic. Like there's a lot of people who just didn't want to talk about it. I, I wrote a, a, a an article about how ER doctors need to prepare. I think it came out in late February, early March of 2020. Not everybody was you know, fully on board with what was going to happen. And I got a lot of actually hate mail from emails actually saying like, why are you talking about this? You're just scaring people like this. This isn't going to happen. Think about the economy. Think about other stuff. But ignoring it isn't going to make it go away. And so the more that we know, the more solutions. And part of what I try and keep in mind is that like the more we talk about it, the more that all your listeners who have, have the solutions at their fingertips are going to get the more support to to do what they need to do, to find those new innovations, to, to keep moving forward. And so I think it's, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. And I, I just think it needs to be talked about and, and, and help move awareness forward. Uh, what, what's the balance for you personally, Dara, if you don't mind me asking a, a personal question between anxiety and optimism? How, how do you feel? Three years ago, I was, I was walking through, you know, the, those ruins in, in Abaco. And, and when I thought about that, and when I think about it and put myself back there, like when I was, those two weeks that I spent on that island were, were, were very depressing um, to see what, what happened to them. And on one hand, it keeps me in that sort of, it, it harkens me back to that mind state. But then I also look forward and be like, okay, so we've got to move forward and keep, keep motivated to 
grasp onto and move forward with all the great innovations that you and your listeners are moving forward to. And it's a delicate balance. And as an emergency physician, I see, you know, tragedy on a daily basis. And so what one thing that we are used to is, you know, uh, uh, everybody's health can change at the drop of a hat. You know, you could be healthy one day and unhealthy the next. And that's what I think is, is extremely powerful about telling this story is that like, we've all know what it means for health to change. Climate change is impacting health on the grandest of scales. And so let's make sure that we do things to mitigate that. And that's, you know, another great discussion too is adaptation versus mitigation. And then a third term is suffering. Like we're all going to have, you know, depending on how much we mitigate, we're going to have to adapt or suffer in some sort of sense. And so I keep in mind of trying to be constructive and, 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 and positive, but it, sometimes it is a challenge, um, just like dealing with anything in the medical care system is. So we've been talking a lot about the problems. I'm curious if you guys have some like solutions, like what can people do as individuals to both lower their, their impact on climate and improve health? Yeah, I think the simplest answer I could give is just eat less or no red meat. We know the, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated, both CO2 and methane with, with the um, red meat industry and the cattle industry. But the other flip side of the coin too, is all of the carcinogenic, carcinogenic excuse me, effects of red meat and pork. Um, you know, the, in, the increased rates of colon cancer associated with frequent uh, red meat uh, intake. I think that's just one simple thing that anybody could take off the table of, hey, look, I'm helping. In a, in, you know, if everybody's small action in, turns into a large action, as we saw, you know, th- with the recent California heat wave, when everybody turned up their, uh, turned up their thermostats, that really helped out the whole grid. So, if we help out all of the red meat grid out there, I think it's all going it, to, it's, that's one simple way that I would recommend for your own health and the health of the planet. Yeah. Love it. That's an easy one. Jason, what do you have? I can take a stab. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty frustrated uh, to be honest, because anytime you do anything, there's a bunch of people in the climate community that are like, that's not good enough. That's not pure enough. Totally. Like, it's right. It's like, you know, you could go and decarbonize. You like, you could like put heat pumps in and put solar on your roof and drive an EV and put spin in and, and like do all this stuff. And they're like, well, you're still living in a home. Right. And it's like, <laughs> or I could just live in a home and not do any of that shit. Right. Like, what do you prefer? Like to, to for me to take my family and go like, you know, move into a 500 foot. Con- I mean, and look, people do it. I'm not, I'm not saying they don't, but sure. like, I'm not going to do it by choice. I'll do it if I have to, if I don't have any other options. But those people that do it, if they had other options, they wouldn't fucking do it, right? So it's it's like, I don't know, I get really frustrated. But um, but the, the the answer is that nothing is enough, but something's better than nothing. And small things yeah. lead, to, lead to more things, lead to bigger things. And each person can find their own superpower. And some people will say, you know, I'm not ready to leave my career and like throw it all away. And But like, I'm going to you know, donate my time, or I'm going to be philanthropic, or I'm going to really be cognizant about my own footprint, or I'm going to make sure to vote, or I'm going to lobby my employer to get more active in this area, and to, and or I'm going to come up, drive an initiative internally to help, you know, uh, clean up our own footprint with what we do as this big multinational corporation, or there, I mean, there's so many things you can do, it all helps and none of it's enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that wasn't helpful at all. I'll name one though for <laughs> you. <laughs> Uh, so we just, I just did this episode with Arlene Blum and, um, she recommended to reduce purchasing of products with these, these forever chemicals, including Teflon umbrellas, anything that has kind of that, the water resistant, um, chemicals that are made into it because they don't break down and they're known to, you know, have negative health impacts. So kind of just educating yourself on these forever chemicals and, you know, how they're like single use plastics and it's not enough, but it's something. Yeah, well, it's really great uh, just kind of cross-pollinating in this way. And I don't know that we uncovered any answers, but I, as, uh, <laughs> as, as, as we talked about during the show, we're starting the dialogue and just talking about it and starting to work through these problems and kind of psychologically put yourself in the mindset and challenge your assumptions and things like that. I, I think that that is what will ultimately lead to solutions, even if it isn't a linear path. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the show. And let's make this an ongoing discussion as well. Thank you, Jason. This is fun. Yeah, sounds good.
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seely. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.